um, our final presentation in this panel. I'm sorry, our third presentation in this panel, not the final one, is titled What New King Alfred of Baseball? Nicknames as Artifacts. And the art of the abstract for this promises surprising connections between U.S. baseball players and pre conquest England in terms of onomastic studies. Our presenter is Tristan Alfie who is a PhD student in history at Cross County Career Member of the Royal Historical Society. This paper starts with a deceptively simple question. Uh, for the historian of medieval nicknames, what use are the vast wealth of socio-onomastic case studies derived from societies that are geographically and chronologically alien to us? Paralyzed by their accusation of anachronism, can we use the findings of modern nickname surveys to guide our research into those nicknames of the past, specifically medieval ones? My own research focuses on nicknames in early medieval England, which I'm going to broadly date here circa 410 to 1100. I'm trying to understand the social motivations behind their origins and to work backwards from what is a relatively plentiful corpus of nicknames to identify the now invisible systems that structured life in early medieval England. Are the works of modern socionomasts like uh, Skipper, whose work explores the role of nicknames among American jazz players and baseball players, relevant to my research? Can we apply models that explain their use and distribution to early medieval data? Or, in the slightly tongue-in-cheek title of this paper, what knew someone like King Alfred of, for example, baseball? Now, while there have been a great number of groundbreaking studies into medieval nicknames, it is clear that there is no rigorous methodology on how best to apply broader social onomastic theory to our historical case studies, least of all for the historian who is untrained in onomastics. So where might we begin to look to construct one? The solution I'm going to tentatively suggest here lies actually in archaeology. Uh, Garrison, in her study of Alcuin's nicknames at Charlemagne's court, introduces the metaphor of nicknames as an artifact. Carried to its logical conclusion, seeing nicknames as artifacts helps us to structure our understanding of their role in society and ask more productive questions of them. Now, the archaeologist is met with a similar conundrum to the student of medieval onomastics. The evidence that we have uh, surviving to us as modern scholars is what Lewis Binford has termed a static contemporary phenomenon. Artifacts exist in the modern world, and they're silent and decontextualized in a similar manner to historical nicknames. However, artifacts and nicknames are the products of complex and interconnected social systems and patterns of behavior these no longer exist. How do we go about moving between the two? How do we find the social systems from the silent decontextualized uh, existence of evidence in the modern day? Now, the archaeologists of the processualist school of archaeology, which emerged in the 1950s and the 1960s and was led by Lewis Binford, find a solution in the construction of so-called middle range theories. Uh, these are theoretical models that attempt to bridge the gap between present and past by correlating behavior with material outcome. They aim to identify causal relationships, proposing a correlation between certain actions and certain physical remains. Uh, the case for the student of the historical of historical social onomastics is at a fundamental level no different. We too want to travel from the silent and decontextualized items nicknames, back to the historical systems that created them. We too are interested in the formation processes of these names, what behaviours led to their construction. Can we begin to construct and use middle range theories for this purpose? And how are we best to go about constructing them? Well, for the archaeologist, Binford suggested we should experience living systems. The archaeologist is ethno-archaeology. Unlike inquiry into historic societies, ethnography brings the distinct advantage that both processes and the result of those processes can be simultaneously observed and their relationship can therefore be analyzed at greater depth. 
Now, we have a wealth of uh, contemporary fieldwork studies on the origins, themes, and roles of nicknames from across the world and in a vast range of languages. Can these, as a historian of medieval nicknames, act as our middle range theories? Now, in proposing this, I've been preempted uh, somewhat, as all students of medieval onomastics have at some point, by Cecily Clark. Clark's essay, Nickname Creation, is a broad ranging exploration of the potential of studying nicknames, noting optimistically that present day nicknames might yield analogies or contrasts such as would cast uh, at least a flickering light on medieval practices. So what does this all mean, practically speaking? Well, the proposed approach is illustrated on the slide here and this very advanced uh, graphic made in PowerPoint, um, but we can be simplified as follows. If we find evidence among the broader pool of onomastic fieldwork to propose a certain social system or pressure manifests itself in a specific pattern or theme in nickname data, this is our starting point. Secondly, if we have a corpus of nicknames from a historical society which we wish to investigate through a social onomastic lens, this is our ending point. Within this, we can identify a number of trends, themes, uh, and quantities of names, demographic distribution, and variation over time. Now, if we transpose the observations of correlation from modern ethnographic fieldwork onto our historic data, we are moving between, uh, as this illustration uh, represents, the present and the past where we see similar patterns and themes in the historic nickname data, we are pointed towards a similar causal social system at play. Now, I, I can hear the murmurs of objection already, so let me clarify a few things. No universal laws are proposed. No attempt to suggest that a certain social pressure or change must result in a specific change in the structure of nickname data. Instead, these middle range theories propose ways in which the systems might have impacted nickname data. They allow us to construct hypotheses that can then be tested against context, structuring our approach to alien data by proposing meaningful questions to be asked of it. Uh, when they are found by literary or archeological evidence to be inapplicable within a certain context, they can be easily discarded. This act in itself has provided information on the historical society under investigation. Now, I appreciate this is all very abstract. So let's try uh, and find a case study to illustrate the utility of this approach. Now, James Skipper, sociologist at the University of North Carolina uh, at Greensboro, provided perhaps the most consistent set of writings outlining a socio-onomastic approach to nicknames, uh, particularly focusing on near contemporary American cultures. Uh, baseball players provide a valuable social onomastic case study, Skipper argues, because of a combination of the sport's importance to American cultural heritage and the exhaustive recording of socially contextualized onomastic data since the 1870s. Trends he identifies is that nicknames among baseball players are relatively frequent until the 1950s and decline sharply thereafter. So we're returning to this tongue in cheek question posed at the beginning of this inquiry. What knew King Alfred and of baseball, and how might Skipper's proposed models, contextualised within baseball players, be put to productive use when examining our early medieval English onomastics? Can we ever escape an accusation of anachronism? So let's take an example of a rejective and yet productive hypothesis. Skipper suggests that the early frequency of nicknames among baseball players is tied to a widespread belief that baseball reflected the American dream and that the prevalence of nicknames implies a degree of intimacy, closeness, and personal identification. Underlying this is the contemporary concept of the folk hero, which Skipper defines as persons of low social class and origins who have risen to fame and fortune by the power of their individual skill, determination, and hard work. Now, the decline in the use of baseball nicknames can be explained, Skipper goes on to suggest, by a change in the perception of baseball players caused by a broader social change within American society. Commercialization of the sport uh, and a broader death of the American dream set in place a steep decline in fans' ability to identify with baseball players and subsequently the use of nicknames. 
uh, a similar pattern amongst uh, the nicknames of jazz musicians would seem to imply that this is not simply a quirk of the baseball leagues, but symptomatic of a broader systemic change in American society. Underlying Skipper's work on baseball players is the deceptively simple hypothesis, the ability of nicknames to decrease social distance between individuals. Now, importantly, Skipper frames this reduction of social distance as decidedly informal and begins to draw a distinction between the social, social spheres in which these nicknames are used. Wilson and Skipper's examination of the nicknames of female baseball players suggests that nicknames are infrequently recorded within official documents. Other social onomastic studies identify this process particularly strongly in regard to negative, critical and offensive nicknames. De Clark and Bosch have found this to be the case in their study of South African teenagers, as Pitt Rivers has done in studying the communities of the Spanish Sierra. Within a later medieval English context, Selton's articles on uh, by-names in Middle English suggest that the official character of medieval documents discourages the use of offensive names. So we therefore might approach our early medieval English data with a hypothesis suggested by Skipper. Negative nicknames are infrequent in official documents. Now, we can convincingly demonstrate that this is not the case in early medieval England. Nicknames that appear to be critical of their bearers are frequent among official, legal and administrative documents. Uh, it's hard to see how Eofgate uh, Garst, whose name literally means Deepman, uh, might be anything other than socially critical, but his name appears in the Inquestio Commentatus Contabrigensis, likely part of the process of data collection for the Doomsday Book survey predating its final product. Godwin Grelling, whose name translates as Rage and who was recorded as holding land in Bury St Edmunds uh, in Suffolk in the later 11th century, presumably has a nickname that reflects his community's criticism of his short temper. All the more pressing are the apparent examples of self-identification with apparently negative nicknames. Osgod Clapper, a prominent Anglo-Danish thane during the reign of King Canute, has a nickname traditionally translated as coarse or rough. Uh, this nickname appears when he witnesses uh, a charter of 1044, um, a writ of King Edward, and as a witness of a Norfolk Shire Court in 1043. Significantly, Osgod appears here to be signing his own name as a negative clapper in an apparent act of self-identification. Now, whether Osgod was happy with the nickname is unknowable, but an acceptance of it seems clear. While Selden is certainly correct to identify that, onomastically speaking, written sources do not always faithfully reflect spoken usage, this argument of restraint within official documents therefore cannot be the case in early medieval England. We've brought a hypothesis based on alternative onomastic work to our historic data. It has led us to ask valuable questions, prompting us to look at the data in a specifically socio-onomastic light. We have ultimately rejected this hypothesis, but this process of disproving a hypothesis generates further interesting socio-onomastic uh, socio questions. Why are shocking and offensive nicknames tolerated in this way? Are we dealing with jest? How does name calling correspond with early medieval concepts of humour? Why is there no surviving legal prohibition on the use of offensive nicknames, as we find in both, for example, the Quran and the 13th century Icelandic Gragas laws? Is this a reflection of a uniquely English attitude. From this hypothesis rejection, more social onomastic hypotheses quickly emerge to be tested. Brune, in examining Roman cognomena, suggests that members of the aristocracy accepted additional names from their social inferiors, irrespective of their implication, as a possible mechanism for gaining favour. Are we to understand negative nicknames in early medieval England as a necessary, if perhaps painful, method of gaining support? Alternatively, Barrett, examining nickname traditions in rural northern Spain, notes a wider social acceptance of negative nicknames when they are inherited from previous generations. Pitt Rivers research supports this, suggesting that to be called a bald one while you have your hair is no great hurt. How does the evidence for inherited nicknames after the Norman conquest of 1066, perhaps acting as proto surnames, impact our interpretation of their themes? Now, our nickname data is no longer nebulous and amorphous, confined to hundreds of entries in a database, but it's structured around a number of illuminating and interesting questions. The application of middle range theory supplies a number of necessary questions to ask of the data guiding our research. 
To begin, when I began this paper, I asked a deliberately facetious question. What knew King Alfred of baseball? Uh, that this is an important question is now clear. What use are socio-onomastic hypotheses that are chronologically and geographically alien to the historian? Can models of nickname usage and meaning generated by research into 19th and 20th century baseball players be applied to early medieval England? It has been argued here that they can, and indeed, with careful management, they should be. In achieving this goal, we have adopted the methodology laid down by the Processional School of Archaeology, in particular the work of Lewis Binford. By conceptualizing nicknames as artifacts, we can attempt to move backwards to the systems that generated them by the use of middle range or causal theories. These middle range theories can be drawn from modern ethno-onomastic case studies, benefiting from a depth and flexibility that sparse medieval data does not afford. Crucially, these are understood to provide not universal guiding laws concretely established uh, establishing which social systems equate to what animastic trends, but examples of how a social system might perhaps manifest itself in animastic data that can then be tested as a hypothesis. In bringing these hypotheses to the medieval data to be tested, accepting, rejecting, or amending them in the process, the historian might more methodologically approach a large set of impenetrable nickname data while opening new animastic questions for future research. Alfred knew nothing of baseball, of course, but this does not negate the use of baseball in understanding Alfred. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am happy to uh, accept any questions that you have. That was a great deal of fun, Tristan. Uh, you, you did exactly what you promised. You brought us both Babe Ruth and King Alfred. Would you like to comment a little bit about perhaps the universal applicability? Um, you've talked to us about the middle range and applied it to these particular sets. What do you see as the wider use? Uh, well, that's a very, very good question. Um, I think so just the structure is the primary. So obviously we're going to have an incredibly alien middle range. Um, uh, and so, as I briefly mentioned there, historians and especially medieval historians panic very quickly at being accused of vernacularism. You know, anything that's 50 years out, they'll say, oh, there's no applicability here. So the idea that it could be hundreds is um, e even more ridiculous. Um, yes, I think as long as we, we bring um, these hypotheses at, well, as hypotheses rather than, you know, solid conclusions, um, but one thing that has been made very interesting by my research in this is that um, th there do appear to be some things that humans don't change that much over time. You know, that these nicknames from a thousand years ago, you know, some of them wouldn't be that out of place today in, in bars, in locker rooms, you know, on sports teams. Um, and yes, obviously, we're not copy pasting how the past understood themselves onto how we understand themselves. But perhaps the differences aren't as big as we would think. <laughs> I'm thinking of Professor Volk's presentation earlier this afternoon. Well, it was the afternoon for my time zone, not necessarily for everybody else's, um, but his use of nicknames there. It seems to be the almost universal practice to rename people informally, and those names stick to yeah a, a fascinating process um but then what i didn't manage to get into as much as i'd like in in this um is, is the question of how gender plays into those nicknames um and how we compare those um lots of people have um kind of imagined nicknames as this kind of sort of masculine uh sphere of name calling which is you know almost certainly not true as we know that everybody uses them it's just in our medieval sources we have so few women recorded with nicknames that it's so hard to explore the systems behind them if i'm not mistaken a lot of your work already has to do with surnames uh, do you want to make any comments on that and your transfer of knowledge from studying surnames to by names well 
uh, I am very lucky in, in studying that that perfect overlap in English history. Um, in that it, I don't think anyone would want to put an exact date on when it happens, but at some point after the Norman Conquest, we have the sort of standardization of, of, of by names that then become inherited in, in the long term. Um, and I would like to do a lot more research into that, into the interplay between them and see if there's any movement towards it before the Norman Conquest and whether it just sort of <laughs> arrives out of nowhere with the French, we'll have to see. Definitely. In the meantime, um, Anne has a question. Go ahead, Anne. Just a matter of clarification. Did I understand correctly that you are using um, baseball and particularly baseball players of a particular era as perhaps equivalent to the aristocracy of their day, um, Babe Ruth and others being kind of the royalty of American baseball players at a particular time? Uh, in 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 many ways, yes, and I guess the kind of the relationship of an elite with the population, and then testing how that far more demonstrable relationship between power and nicknames from the baseball players can then be transferred onto the far less clear history. And do you see that same um, use of nicknames in sports, in other cultures, other times? Um, it, it, it would appear so, um, and th that specifically that change in the frequency of nicknames involved with the uh, kind of popular perception of sports players in the kind of American dream psyche. Um, there's some suggestion that um, in this medieval history you get a similar change as well when it's kind of evolutions in land holding politics and the way that people uh, sort of conceptualize their overlords. Just in the last word you spoke was overlord, um, which takes me back to some of the Marvel comics and some of the other thoughts. Do you have any closing thoughts you want to share with us? Uh, just the, the, the fascination of that that the previous talk on the uh, on the Marvel names. I think I am I was sort of drawn to looking at sort of more nicknames in in sort of Marvel the fiction world in the future. I think I might after this go off and have another look. <laughs> It's kind of amazing where they come up with the names for U.S. baseball players. <laughs> yes, um, I imagine. Uh, well, I like that a lot of imagination went into it. <laughs> Good fun. <laughs> and I like the earlier presentation today, too, on the sets of imagined names for a whole imagined team put together by a couple of um, comedians. So yes. we Americans really like our sports. <laughs>